Hi everybody, Jacob Reed here from ReviewEcon.com. This is the last video of the year for me and uh, we're gonna go over the 2022 Microeconomics FRQ Set 2. Uh, I, this, today is the first day I've seen these questions. This is an unboxing video. I don't know what the rubrics are actually going to say. These are just my best guess answers based on my knowledge about microeconomics and past rubrics. They threw a lot of curveballs at us in this set. If you got this set, I expect it was quite difficult. But don't worry, remember if it was difficult Difficult for you, it was probably difficult for everybody, and the number of points required to show proficiency could change. Uh, at least I expect it to. Um, you never know exactly what's going to happen at the reading, but I wouldn't panic yet. Wait till July, wait till you see those scores, and may the odds be ever in your favor, of course. All right, uh, let's go ahead and jump into it. Uh, first of all, we've got uh, sugar is per produced in a perfectly competitive market and we use inputs from a perfectly competitive factor market. We're looking at Frank Sugar Company and uh, that's the firm in the sugar market. We're going to draw a side-by-side -side properly labeled graph for this market and firm. We're going to mark the market price and quantity, PM and QM, and the firm's price, PF and the firm's quantity, QF. Here we go, it's just the firm at long run equilibrium because they are currently earning zero economic profit. There you go, I believe you'll get one point for the market and then or, uh, two points for the market and two points for the firm. I expect we'll see, all right? Over on to B for the demand for sugar. Uh, the demand for sugars is going to uh, excuse me. The demand for sugar is going to increase, uh, and it's a constant cost industry. That's just standard economics that we're learning here. So we don't have to make it complicated by moving the average total cost curves within the firm. Uh, and we're going to show the short run effect of an increase in the demand for sugar on the market. And we're going to label the new price P2 and the new quantity for the firm as QN. Boom! There it is. We've got uh, an increase in the demand, which increases the price, driving the Mr. DARP up for the firm as well. We have a higher quantity, profit maximizing quantity of QN. And that new quantity belongs in the firm graph, not the market graph. If you mark the market new, firm, new quantity, that's fine. But QN actually belongs there with the firm. And now you'll, you can see they're actually earning economic profits, although you didn't have to actually shade in those economic profits. Compared to the equilibrium identified in part A, what will happen to the short run profit earned by Frank Sugar Company as a result of the increased demand? So remember they were breaking even or earning zero economic profits and now the profits have increased to positive, right? I believe just saying increase is gonna be just fine, right? On to uh, the next part of uh, part B3, uh, when the market adjusts to long run equilibrium, how will the market price of sugar in the long run compare to P2? So the price has gone up now and it's actually gonna go back down to where it was prior, right? Uh, because the firm has to go back to breaking even in the long run. So here's my answer. It's going to decrease because firms will enter the market seeking economic profits. I believe just enter the market will be enough, which uh, is going to make the market supply curve increase or shift to the right and that will decrease the market price back to where it was before really all right on to C instead sugar uh, instead, instead we're going to assume that sugar consumption has a negative impact on public health over time and the negative impact of sugar on health is underestimated by consumers uh, this is a huge curveball this is the first time they've ever had people draw a, uh, a negative externality in consumption here. So if you struggled to do this, don't worry. Uh, I expect most of my students will have struggled to do this as well. And uh, so I wouldn't stress too much, right? It'll be probably one point for, for having it drawn exactly correct. So. Uh, but what you should do is you would have, oh, we have to mark the market quantity QM and the socially optimal quantity QS. So here's what it looks like. We have a downward sloping demand curve. We have an upward sloping supply curve. The supply curve is that marginal social cost and the marginal private cost. And the downward sloping demand curve is the marginal private benefit. But since we have a negative externality, we're going to subtract the external uh, cost from the demand curve because this is a negative externality in consumption. So that's the way they draw it. They subtract it from the demand curve here or the marginal private benefit to get that marginal social benefit. And it's at the intersection of the marginal social benefit and the marginal social cost curve is where we get QO, all right? So 
this is the first time they've ever had people draw this. So, yep, <laughs> I was thrown for a loop as well. I did not expect this, all right? On to the next one. So assume that government decides to intervene in the market uh, to affect consumer incentives to address the negative impact of sugar consumption on public health. Which of the following policies would best achieve that objective in the short run? Lump sum tax, per unit tax, lump sum subsidy, or per, per unit subsidy. Explain, uh, this is a negative externality, so per unit, not never lump sum, per unit, uh, in this case tax, because it's a negative externality that will give us uh, a quantity that's closer to the allocatively efficient quantity. So I put per unit tax because it would increase the marginal cost and decrease the market quantity, bringing it close closer to the socially optimal quantity, all right? Uh, there you go, all right? On to the next part, D. And this was another curveball here, by the way. <laughs> Hugely, they've never done anything like this one before. Uh, so again, th this one was hard for me too, by the way. Uh, so we have uh, this graph that depicts New Zealand's domestic supply and demand for wool. We're going to first calculate the consumer surplus if New Zealand doesn't trade at all. So hopefully you got this point, we have our consumer surplus is that triangle right there, the quantity of 300, the price of 40. Uh, so you calculate the area of that triangle. It's base times height divided by two. We have a base of 300. We have a height of 70 minus 40, and then multiply that by a half, which gives us 400. Uh, in this case, dollars is the, is the units here, all right? And we showed our work. All right, moving on to the next part. Instead, assume that New Zealand decides to trade the wool in the world market. The current world price is, uh-oh, above the equilibrium price. They've never done that before. It's always been below. So uh, at least they give you a hint here on this first part. They say, how many units of wool will New Zealand export? The graph that we've always seen so far has always been an import amount, and the price has always been below equilibrium, but now it's above. And so they're going to actually export wool. So it's actually going to, there's that world price there. It's at $60. We're going to uh, domestically consume 100 units. We're going to domestically produce 500 units. The difference between the two is going to be exported. So 400 units will be exported here. On to the next part. What will happen to the consumer surplus of wool in New Zealand when New Zealand begins to trade with the rest of the world? Well, it's actually gonna decrease, right? Uh, it's actually gonna be a tiny little triangle at $60 all the way up to uh, 70 right there uh, to the 100 quantity. All right, I'll show it to you in just a minute, all right? Actually, yeah. Uh, so it decreases because the domestic quantity decreases and the domestic price increases, all right? And will the total economic surplus in New Zealand decrease or remain unchanged when, the New, Zealand begin, when New Zealand begins to trade wool in the world market? Explain using numbers. So there is what our economic surplus was prior to the international trade. And that triangle up at the top there, that little tiny triangle that's left out hanging over uh, was our consumer surplus. And so this is actually how much economic surplus there is after trade. That means this triangle here is actually the new economic surplus that is added as a result of this international trade. And so here is my explanation. It increases because, because the quantity domestically produced increases to 500 and the domestic price increases to 60. Uh, economic surplus actually increases by 400 times 20 times a half, which is 4,000, all right? There we go. Assume that the domestic demand uh, for New Zealand increases. Will New Zealand's exports increase, decrease, or stay the same? Well, if we shifted that demand curve to the right, we would actually see the price obviously wouldn't change. The quantity produced domestically would not change, but we would see a greater quantity consumed. So it would decrease. They would just export less, consume more within the economy. All right, on to the third question, our last question for the year. Let's get through it. All right, the graph here shows uh, demand, uh, long run average total cost, marginal cost, and marginal revenue. This is actually a natural monopoly graph. That's what we got here. So uh, over the output range of zero to 60 units, is this firm producing, uh, experiencing economies of scale, diseconomies of scale, or constant returns of scale? Explain, well, as you can see uh, that average total cost curve for all of those units is actually downward sloping. It doesn't start to upward slope until the average total cost or long run average total cost curve intersects that marginal cost curve. And so 
economies of scale because the ATC decreases as output increases through all of those 60 units. All right, using numbers from the graph, identify the price and quantity produced at which the monopolist earns zero economic profit. The break-even price, also called fair return price, is where that long-run average total cost intersects the demand curve, and that is at 50 units. And the price there, the demand curve price, is $15 there, all right? Next, we're going to assume that regulators, regulators impose a price ceiling that results in the firm producing the socially optimal quantity in the short run. Socially optimal quantity is where the marginal cost equals the demand curve or price equals marginal cost. And so uh, that means we have a quantity of 60 and a price of $10. Remember, total revenue is price times quantity. There we go, there's my work there. 60 units times $10 gives us $600. All right, so explain why the firm requires a subsidy to continue producing in the long run at that socially optimal quantity. Well, at that socially optimal, qu optimal quantity of 60, uh, you can see that the average total cost is above our price, so our price is gonna be $10, but the average total cost is higher at 13, so this firm is, is losing money, and it, it, they're actually suffering economic losses. That means their resources uh, would be better suited to other things. They'd be more profitable to other things. So if they are forced to lose economic money or earn economic losses in the long run, they're just gonna shut down permanently and they'll leave the market, they'll exit the market. So here's my answer there, uh, because the firm is earning economic losses. There you go, I think that'll be enough. On to the last part. Uh, we're going to calculate the lump sum subsidy that would be required for the monopolist to reduce the socially optimal or to produce the socially optimal quantity in the long run. Show your work. We're just calculating the area of economic loss. If the firm is provided a lump sum subsidy equal to their economic losses, now they're breaking even and they're not going to exit the market. All right, so the amount of economic loss is 13 minus 10, that's $3 per unit of economic loss times the 60 units being produced there. And that gives us $180 for that lump sum subsidy. And there you go, there you have it. Those are all the uh, 2022 microeconomic FRQs. Um, chat it out in, in the chat below and uh, let me know what you thought about them. I hope you did well. Remember, I would not stress too much about uh, your scores at this point. Uh, wait till July. To, to commiserate. And don't forget, there are plenty of people who did very poorly on microeconomics and macroeconomics AP exams in their life and become very successful individuals. So you are not that score that you end up getting in July. There are plenty other attributes you've got and I'm sure many of them are great attributes. Uh, please let everybody you know that's taking economics uh, about reviewecon.com. I really appreciate you watching and, uh, and going on the website over the last year. Take care, uh, best of luck next year.